and know with absolute certainty the latter half of this century that we're in is going to be dominated by the Muslims. You think Allah is going to allow a, a, a kafir to, up, to lift up the deen? It's never going to happen. It's going to be lifted by people of taqwa only and iman. The faster this ummah, when are they going to get it? If you can change something with your hand, change it with your hand. That means if you have the legal permission to change it, the legal right to change it with your hand. Fathers in the homes, you have jobs. You're, most dads aren't doing the jobs. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma salli salatan kamila wa sallim salaman tamman ala nabiyyin tanhallu bihi al-uqad wa tanfariju bihi al-kurab wa tuqda bihi al-hawaij wa tunalu bihi al-raghaib wa husnu al-khawatim wa yustasqa al-ghamamu bi wajhi al-kareem wa ala alihi. Uh, first thing I want to tell everyone when it comes to Palestine, I want you to put in your head and know with absolute certainty the latter half of this century that we're in is going to be dominated by the Muslims, controlled by the Muslims. And nobody will dare to repeat what has happened, is happening to us now in the latter half of this century. Just write it down and know it for sure as if it's a fact. And why do I say this with so much confidence? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, firstly, does anyone know the ghaib? Nobody knows the ghaib. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about sunnat Allahi fi khalqi. In the Quran, he speaks about Allah has a sunnah in his creation. What does it mean that Allah has a sunnah in his creation? It means that there are patterns. Predictable patterns. That's what a sunnah means. So if I know, if I go to a masjid in Argentina, and the adhan goes off for salah, I know what's going to happen because the Prophet established sunan. I know that there's tahiyyat in masjid, then there's the adhan. If it's maghrib, we're going to pray right away. If it's isha, there may be a little delay between the adhan and the iqamah. Why? The Prophet said sunan. Sunan are made for predictability. It doesn't mean we know the future, but it means to a good extent we can forecast what's coming next. Pattern recognition. There is never, ever, in the sunnah of Allah's creation, a group of people who have dominated their world at that time, except that generation or two before them, they were the ones bullied and battered and pilloried from pillar to post. It's never happened. Every single group of people that has ever dominated over its people, over the world, over their society, over their country, over their continent. Every single one of them were a people that were pushed around only a few generations before. We don't need to go far in history when we have the seerah of the Prophet Today everyone's saying, nobody's doing anything. I watch the news, I can't do anything. All the Arab countries, they're sitting there, they got militaries and guns sitting, collecting dust, and they're not doing anything. Why is nobody doing anything? Everyone's not doing anything for a different reason. Some people, it's out of a punishment that they can't do anything. Other people, they're being tested. And other people, they're being cooked. We, for example, we can't do anything out of no fault of our own. Other Muslim nations watching Gaza getting carpet bombed today and yesterday. And the Mu'addin saying on the microphone to anyone in the world who hears us, we've been cut off. The whole world is bullying a small little patch of land and finding all sorts of justifications for this attack that's happening. Yeah. Some of these Arab leaders cannot do anything because of a curse that is upon them for financial deals that they got into and for weakness that's in their heart and cowardice. And they go to Jahannam for it. Unless they make tawbah. Door of tawbah is always open. But some tawbah is different than other tawbah. You don't make tawbah for watching your brother get killed by go pray two rakahs in the mosque, I'll make tawbah and walk away. No, you're going to pay a price. 
Someone got killed as a result of your sins. So not everyone's the same for the reason why they can't do anything. But we're all the same as an ummah that nobody can do anything. Everyone's sitting watching. And even those who have made deals with the devil and are sitting there watching and they can't do anything, even they feel some pain in their heart when they see their Muslim brothers getting completely obliterated like this. And they see the whole news of the world not even sympathizing, justifying what's going on. Even they feel some pain. Well, go back to the time of the Prophet ﷺ so you can understand the sunnah of Allah in His creation. If you ever study the chapters on warfare and jihad, you will realize that for the first 13, maybe even more than this, 14, 15 years of the message, Muslims were not allowed to lift a finger. <coughs> the Sahaba had to have sabr. The Sahaba had to see Bilal and the likes of him. Okay? They had to see Bilal and the likes of him. Am Ammar ibn Yasir, Sumayya, Yasir himself, all of them get tortured. What can we do, O Messenger of Allah? Have sabr. Watch. Feel the pain. Do nothing. What is the wisdom behind this? As I said, regardless of the reason, there's a wisdom. The wisdom is that when you watch and do nothing and just see the pain, something builds up inside you. You get marinated and cooked. And trust me, this war is not the last one. There's more to come in which we will sit and watch our ummah get obliterated in front of the, the, the whole world, on the stage of the whole world, everyone cheering on this obliteration, nobody doing anything about it, and we can't do anything about it. No one is coming to help us. Nobody's coming to help us. Don't get excited when a non-Muslim somebody makes a little comment or something. Allah will not allow it. No one is coming. We will get cooked on the inside. The creation of a new willpower, a new identity, a new desire, and a new vision. That is what, this is what's going to happen in the coming phase of our ummah. What's going to happen is you're going to start saying, listen, no one's helping us. We are on our own. We are all on our own. And we have to do this ourselves. We're going to have to do this ourselves. And that's going to take a lot of change on the inside. Who is our real allies? Is anybody, I don't, I don't mean to offend anyone who does political work, is anyone going to take you seriously anymore? Not, not a single national level politician, not one, has uttered a word for your brothers and sisters when they get butchered like this. No one's going to take you seriously. I'm going to go for with the Senate. I'm going to go talk to a senator. I'm going to go call my... They're not coming to help you wake up. Nobody's coming. You have nobody but Allah. That is the whole point of tribulation. It's to make you realize you have none but Allah to help you. That's the whole point. The faster we realize this, the faster the end of this tribulation will come. That's the whole point. Every single adult who works in the masjid, they're taking time out of their day, they're sacrificing, they're doing things that they don't have to do. Why are they doing it? At some point in their life, they had a tribulation, a test. All the tests are different. One test may be a divorce, one test may be a death, one test may be cancer, another test may be poverty, another test may be what have you. The haythiyat all differ, the types of tests differ, but the realities are one. The end result of that test, you realize, I have nobody but Allah. And when you real made that realization, you forged a connection. Once you forged a connection, now Allah can, can guide you. Now Allah guides you. Now Allah trains you. Now Allah gives you a tarbiyah. Now after that tarbiyah, then Allah uses you. 
That's the sunnah of Allah with an individual. And the sunnah of Allah with a nation is no different. The moment an entire ummah, meaning the vast majority, more than not, more than 50%, 75% of that ummah comes to the realization nobody on this earth is helping us. We have none other than Allah to turn to for help. That's when everything's going to change. And that's where we have to get to. There are political realities and there are spiritual realities. The spiritual reality is we need this ummah to get to this point. Stop being in love with the British. Stop being in love with the Americans. Stop thinking the UN means anything. Stop thinking anyone means anything or anyone's going to help you. Don't run to Russia. Don't run to the Republicans, to the Democrats. Don't run to any of these people. Now, you may do that strategically, but internally, you can't believe that's any way to help you. You think Allah is going to allow a, a, a kafir to, up, to lift up the deen? It's never going to happen. It's going to be lifted by people of taqwa only and iman. The faster this ummah, when are they going to get it? This war, they didn't get it. Next war, they, when are they going to get it? When is this? That's what the angels are saying. And that's what I imagine. The angels are saying, when are they going to get it? Do they need another war? So this one, what, maybe, maybe this time around, a really good chunk of our population, our ummah, realize no one's coming, no one cares. Actually, they hate you. You have none other than Allah to help you. Maybe a good chunk came to that realization. I believe a good chunk came to that. But is it enough? We'll see. We'll see afterwards. We'll see if the life in the masajid changes afterwards. That's when you're really going to see. And it could happen. Worldwide, you start seeing the masajid get packed up again. Then there's going to come another wave and another wave and another wave until it's very crystal clear that this ummah has transformed. They've transformed. Spiritually, the outside doesn't have to change. In the sense that we don't expect governments to change, we don't expect policies to change. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change the condition of themselves first. So we have to start seeing a groundswell, a ground movement, like the Bani Israel living as slaves under Fir'aun, but Musa guided them. You need Allah, you don't need anybody else. Stop begging these soldiers to stop. You need Allah only. They got that before they ever got the Red Sea to split. Their heart was in the right place first. And they realized, ah, these are just tools of Allah to get us back near to Him. All of these enemies, if it's not Israel, it's China. If it's not China, it's Russia. If it's not Russia, it's England. If it wasn't England, before that it was France. Before France, it was Austria. After that, it was the British Empire. Then it was the Americans. It'll be whoever it is. The point is to get an ummah back to its Lord. For the Bani Israel, if it wasn't the Pharaohs, it would have been somebody else. That's the point. We don't care who the enemy is. It doesn't make a difference who they are. What matters is our spiritual reality. Are we getting nearer to Allah as a result of this? Or are we getting further away? Are Muslims now, what are they going to say now? Arab nationalism? That, that failed. Go, go get pictures. Maybe your grandparents have pictures of what Cairo used to be like in the 40s or the 30s. Then socialism came. They became a bunch of socialists. Iraq, Baghdad, socialists. Syrians, any Syrians here? A bunch of socialists. Okay? Socialists, Marxists. They swapped out Islam for that stuff. These ideas that originated with Karl Marx and, and these guys. And they said, this is the way forward. All right, let's fast forward 50 years. 80, 90 years. Let's go from 1930 to 2020. Let's take a little picture of Baghdad now. Take a picture of the Cairo streets now versus the time of your great-grandpa. The time of your great-grandpa, I guarantee you could see the curb. The street was clean. People were dressed nice. So where did Arab nationalism get you? Got you into the dump and the sewer. At least you were respected. Countries used to want your, your, your intelligent people come work in America, go work in Moscow. My, pop, my dad came here because he got recruited. Oh, you finished a, a, a chemical degree, a degree in chemistry? 
There is an event at the Russian embassy and there is an event at the American embassy. He went to both events. He went to the Russian embassy. At the Russian embassy, a guy stood up straight and gave a lecture on the benefits of communism. But that was asleep. He went to the American embassy. Music, ping pong, fried chicken, pizza. Come to America, have a good time, have a good life. He went to America. <laughs> they were competing for the brains. Is anyone competing for Arab brains? Where did all that nationalism get you? Where did secularism get you? Secularism, separation from Allah's will, remove the deen and come up with our own laws. That's the es essence. Remove what Allah says, let's figure stuff out ourselves with our own brains. That's the essence for the sixth grade definition of secularism. Where did it get you? Your countries are rubble, literally rubble. Iraq is rubble. Libya is rubble. Syria is literally rubble. When you eat, don't get the message. If this ummah goes far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah sends an enemy that will destroy it. That's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu You will not leave the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the law that God gave you, except that Allah will send you an enemy to destroy your homes and kill your bodies, kill you. And you will not leave my sunnah except that you will all argue amongst yourselves and divide amongst yourselves. And that's exactly what we did. We have a line here that separates between Palestine and Egypt. A line right here separates between Lebanon. This is an imaginary line. Why are we accepting this as a people? Why is our ummah accepting these lines? There's a line here that's Syria. This is Syria, this is Jordan. You're Jordanian, you can't walk here. Saudi, there's the Sa Saudi and Jordan, Tabuk. Right, that's where, that's where the line is. You can't step here. If you're born here, this is your right. You're born here, this is your right. Says who? Says a French guy and a British guy. They put the lines here and you accepted it. Why are we accepting this stuff? We have to wake up as an ummah. You think this is a khitab for the whole ummah. You think, oh, we're just a group of people in Dallas. Yes, but we have to start talking. We have to have a new vision, a new character. Just get it in our heads. Nobody is helping. We have to help ourselves. We have to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and begin. We got to begin the whole thing from scratch. The whole path of the whole path of Tawbah has to be trekked from scratch. Start it all over. Make Tawbah from everything. All of these ideas that we've accepted from socialism, the Ba'athist movements, these Arab nationalism. All of these, these things that we went to to build up our lives and build up our ummah instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Burn it all. End it all. You see someone who makes tawbah, it's inspiring. I've seen many people, they tell us a story about their tawbah. One guy was in a band. When he decided to make tawbah, and he made a dis firm decision. He's a sheikh today. But he made a firm decision he's going to change his life. He used to be a guitarist. He said, when I made that decision, I made it in such a way that there's no way for me to fall back into what I did. So I said, how? He said, the first thing I did, I got my scissors. I took these $500 guitars and I cut them. I cut the strings and I broke the guitar. Someone said, you could have sold it. He said, no, because selling it would have taken time. I may have changed my mind. I wanted to make it in such a way there's no way to turn back. You may ask, well, what am I supposed to do? You are part of the ummah. You are one grain of sand in a beach. That is the ummah. Right now, that beach is completely polluted. That beach, nobody wants to go to it. That beach is dirty. I'm just a grain of sand. All I can do is clean myself and the areas around me. That's all you can do. The Prophet ﷺ said, our concern is the ummah. If you are not concerned with the affairs of the ummah, you're not one of us. Meaning you're not acting like one of us. You're not fulfilling the dues of being part of this ummah. You've got to pay your dues. What are my dues? You have to care. If there's a problem with the Rohingyans, you've got to look it up, study what the Rohingyans are, and care for them. If there's a problem... In India, you got to study where is the issue. I'm not Indian, but let me study. I have an ability to learn what's the fitna happening there to those people. 
If there's a problem with the Muslims of France, they're not, this year they weren't allowed to wear the abayas. Before that, they weren't allowed to wear hijabs. You got to study what, what is the law, what's happening. You have to be concerned with your ummah. We all have technology that allows knowledge to be acquired easily. You can study easily. But as for our action, the Prophet ﷺ was approached by a man full of zeal. And he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm ready to go out. The Prophet ﷺ said, You're only one man. Tell people about me even one ayah. One thing. All your action has to be for yourself. And then it has to be for the people you live with. And it has to be with your friend group. You have to be active with them. The action has to be a return to every big and small detail that is an obligation upon us and removing every prohibition. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi is oftentimes we talk about him. Whenever we're in a situation like this, where is the next Salah al-Din coming from? Well, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, he came from a whole generation a whole generation of youth like this that were listening to speeches of Nuruddin Zenki. Nuruddin Zenki was one of a small group who was listening to a sheikh in, 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 in Iraq who was giving speeches about this. So Salah al-Din is the third generation. Now Nuruddin Zenki, one time he had a very troubling dream of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just to show you, it takes a whole generation, a whole friend group to turn back to Allah. That's your job. Your job is, I need to get my friend group to turn back to Allah, and I am contributing to the revival of an ummah. You don't believe it, but it's true. You may not believe it. Ah, how am I reviving an ummah? You are, because you're part of it. And the ummah is not one big block. It's nothing other than a whole bunch of people just like you. So if you can do it, you may inspire another person to do it, and another, and another, and another. Your job is yourself and the few people around him. To show you what kind of generation they had. Nuruddin is like he had a dream of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Nuruddin, he gets a dream of the Prophet. Nuruddin saved me from these two men, and he sees two fair-looking, like uh, blondish-haired men. So he has this dream. He doesn't understand what it means. He's in Damascus. He sleeps, he sees the dream again. He wakes up, he doesn't understand what's going on. Who are these two men? He's in Damascus, what does it have to do with the Prophet Wasallam? He, mean, he thinks maybe the Sunnah is under attack. Something like that. So he sleeps again, the third time the Prophet tells him, Nuruddin, save me from these two men. He gets up right away, he makes wudu, he goes down to the mosque of the palace, and it's the middle of the night, it's Tahajjud. Like that period of time before Fajr. Who does he find there? The Prime Minister. Already praying Tahajjud. That's the kind of Ummah that they had. That's why Allah gave him success. Nur is the, 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 the king, the Sultan, who trained Salah al-Din. Salah al-Din was one of his youth under him. So. He goes down, he already finds his prime minister is right there. His prime minister was a mufti and a sheikh. And he knew dream interpretation, so he told him the dream. He said, Nuruddin, this is a true dream. These, there are two blonde men in Medina. They're going to do something to the grave of the Prophet. Go immediately, pray Fajr, and leave immediately. He prays Fajr, he leaves immediately, goes from Damascus, takes his entourage. They arrive in Medina. He announces every adult should come to, to me because I'm going to give him a gift. And he starts giving gifts, sacks of silver and gold coins to every adult male so he could look. Does they look like the people in this dream? Everyone in Medina came, no blondes. No two blonde guys the, the way he saw them in a dream. So he said, there's got to be someone else. They said, yeah, there are there is two newcomers. They're travelers. They say they're from Morocco. He said, oh, you have to bring them too. They said, we don't need money, we're good. They said, well, he's saying you have to come, you have no choice. They bring the two and he said, these are the two. They said, take us to your homes. What's, what's your business here? No, we're from Morocco, we're making, 
Hajj, Morocco? You don't have an accent of Morocco? Take us to your home. Let's investigate their homes. They go out to their homes. They investigate the home. They start picking up stuff. They found a big hole in the ground. They're digging a ditch from outside the masjid, under the ground, to excavate the body of the Prophet Nuruddin arrests them and executes them right away. And then he orders for a whole circle to be built around the Prophet's mosque and to be filled with lead so nobody could dig through it and do this ever again. They admitted, we're French. We're French and we were sent by the Crusaders, the Christians, to do this. At that time, there were four Christian cities. The French had come and made four cities. Jerusalem was one of them. Ascalon, I believe, was one of them. There are two others. I always forget what the four are. Who knows what the four Latin kingdoms, the four cities of the Latin kingdom are? Odessa is one of them. What's the other one? Well, there's four cities that they conquered. Jerusalem was one of them. So they were there causing trouble. And they sent two people to excavate the body of the Prophet. Okay. Yet the Prophet وسلم, knows and sees. This is our aqidah. The Prophet وسلم, said, I see your deeds. Some people, they can't imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very well. They see like, I don't really understand. But they can easily understand a human being. The Prophet وسلم, said, Your deeds are shown to me. I see your deeds. I see your deeds. And the ulama explain every person who's born into this ummah, the Prophet has received their name and has shown their deeds. فَإِنْ وَجَدْتَ خَيْرًا حَمَدْتَ اللَّهِ If I see that you did good, I thank Allah. وَإِنْ وَجَدْتَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ اسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَكُمْ If I see that your deeds are not good, are other than that, I make forgiveness for you, seek forgiveness for you. The Prophet ﷺ is alive in his grave, a greater life than his life here. Proof being that he knows the affairs that are happening is this dream to Nur al-Din. Another proof was for Bilal, the Sahabi Bilal. After the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, he moved to Damascus. And he lived in Damascus. And he didn't visit Medina for two years. And the Prophet ﷺ came to him in a dream. Ya Bilal, ma hadha al-jafaf? Oh Bilal, what is this distance? Two years he didn't visit. Immediately he woke up, packed his bag, said to his wife, let's go, we'll go to Medina. They went to Medina. And that's the famous story in which he arrived at Medina. Hassan and Hussein begged him to give the adhan again. When he gave the adhan, he couldn't pass by saying, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, and the whole city was in tears at remembering the voice of Bilal ibn Rabah. Many, 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 many stories of the Prophet ﷺ knowing the affairs of his ummah and watching and praying for those who are doing good works. Your job is with your friends and your family. And whatsoever you could do after that. If you can change something with your hand, change it with your hand. That means if you have the legal permission to change it, the legal right to change it with your hand. Fathers in the homes, you have jobs. You're, most dads aren't doing the jobs. The screen time, the junk, the sins that are coming through kids' phones, tablets, they go to sleep with their phones. They don't know how to wake up in school. They look like sick. They don't sleep. Dads, you are responsible in the sight of Allah. You paid for the house. You paid for the home. You paid for the kid. Open the door. Take the phone away. You have legs. You have arms. That's what Allah is going to ask you. Oh, but my son. Okay, you, did you have legs? You have arms? What's the problem here? Why, do you have a, why is there a cell phone problem in the home? S cell phoning at the kitchen table, no manners with his parents. Look. Sometimes, one time a dad said to him, look. Look at what? All I see is a dad who doesn't know he has any ability. Why don't you get up with the hands and feet that bought this house 
and take the phone and smash it. Or just take it away. You have hands and feet. That's the meaning of changing with you. We have problems in our own home. Forget the ummah. In our own homes, if this screen is not monitored, there's no tawbah in the house. Most Muslim homes will not have alcohol, will not have zina, will not have shirk. They will pray, they will fast, they will pay zikah. But why don't we progress as an ummah? Because the screen's sucking the iman out of the hearts and filling it with poison. I'm telling you, it's the biggest fitna. You can't solve, you cannot clean a beach without cleaning every grain of sand. Every one of us has to get polished. Every one of us got to get polished. And the problem inside the homes, I'm telling you, guaranteeing you, the number one issue is coming through the screens. And that's how our enemies are reaching our hearts. Yes, and there are enemies. There are innocent people out there doing stuff, and there are enemies that are trying to corrupt your hearts with filthy images. And with a culture of pop music that would just, it leads, never leads to good. But the dads, it's your responsibility. Every kid who goes astray at 17 and you bring him to the masjid, hey, Imam, help me. It's too late. The, this 17 way, and he's acting this way, that was planted at age seven and you didn't do anything about it. You can't come, oh, there's a big oak tree, we got a problem. That oak tree didn't come from nowhere. That oak tree came 10 years ago. It was growing and you didn't do anything. So I'm waking you up if you're not awake to it. Wake up and to the power that you have in your own home. Oh, my kid's not going to like me. He doesn't have to like you. You have a job. What liking? Do I like you? What is, oh, he, he needs to like me. I need him to like me. At what cost? Three-year-old needs to like me. He, he wants to play with the steak knife. Oh, I don't want to upset him. He's going to cry if I take it away. Pick one. Three-year-old walking around with a steak knife or he's going to cry for two minutes, but he's safe. He's going to cry for two minutes, but he's safe. You think kids don't have brains? They're not dumb. They know this is for their own benefit. I tell them, listen, you're not going to like this. I have to do it. I don't have to do it because of any other reason that Allah is going to make me do it. I'm going to be judged on Yom Al-Qiyam. I'm not going to hell for anyone else. I'm not going to go to hell from someone else's sins. I have to stop. This is my job as a father. It is your job as a Muslim father to make sure these images do not enter your homes. That's your job. There comes a time at night, Maghrib, Isha, all these devices get put into your room. There's no such thing as sleeping with the device in, in, in the bed. Then the kids fail in school, his skin is pale, his teeth are falling out, his hair falls out. Okay, you think I'm kidding? These kids who don't get good sleep, they get bald at 15 now. I'm not joking. They don't get good sleep. Your body doesn't regenerate. How are you going to get married? I'll tell you the scariest, freakiest thing. I'll tell you the scariest, freakiest thing. It applies to girls too. Girls are going bald. I'm telling you, and I don't want to offend anyone. It's more sensitive. All right, A guy can go bald, whatever. He's going to live. A woman cannot go bald. It's a very painful experience for her, okay? But it's happening because of poor sleep. It's that simple. They don't sleep well. Their body is not regenerating. They're hitting the age 20 and 15, combing and crying, crying. And then hitting like 30 and 40, and you start see through the whole hairline. This is very sad. This is very sad, but it's avoidable. But you have to know the reason. What generations are raised now sleeping, scrolling until two and three, but they got to wake up until six. How are you getting any health like this? Right? This is a big problem. All these are related. The ummah did not go astray except individuals went astray. And nobody said anything. Nobody did anything about it. Jazakum Allah khairan. Let's open it up, inshallah. Qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah alayhi wa rakum.